Ladies and gentlemen, the viewers of Civ Space TV, you're welcome to the second episode of our Community Voices webinar. Uh, last week, we talked about COVID-19 lockdown and how it is affecting communities at the grassroots. If you notice, we have a series of these discussions, so it would be wise for you to go to our YouTube, YouTube channel and subscribe, and also turn on the notification, just in case similar discussions come up. We have one with the youths, we have one that looks at the politics of the day, and we have a couple of others. It is very informative and interactive. That said, today is the second uh, Community Voices webinar. We had the first one last week. And the topic for discussion today is going to be the relationship between ordinary citizens and government, and government, the crisis of service delivery in Uganda. So if you look at that, you're going to look at two aspects, the relationship with the citizens and the government and the issue of service delivery in Uganda. So our discussion is going to run from 10 a.m. up to about 12 p.m. We are going to have a group of four panelists chosen from the community. They are community leaders in their various communities, and they're going to help us look at this discussion and dissect it fully for the viewers out there, you the viewers to understand this well. So allow me to introduce my panel. We have Imalingat Sara. Sara is a tutor at Ndegea Primary School Teachers College in Masaka. We have Gubi Kenneth. Gubi Kenneth is a politician and he comes from the district of Iganga, that's in Busoga sub region on the Eastern front of the Uganda, of, on Uganda. Then we shall have Nanduga Anet, who is a lecturer at the prestigious Chambogo University. And we shall be joined by Amir Kisha, who is a volunteer at Asian Charity. We hope to have a very meaningful discussion. Now, let me give you the background to our discussion. Like I introduced the topic, let me introduce a few of the basic words that will define this discussion. The first is the term government. Depending on who you talk to, depending on what you read, government can be defined in different ways. First, it can simply mean a group of people who control and make decisions for the state, country, or similar organizations. In the second sense, it can also mean the manner of controlling a country or state. You realize that, for instance, when you talk about Uganda, we say the Mengo government. So that the aspect of government, while oftentimes used in reference to countries and nation states can actually go beyond that. But for the sake of today's discussion, we're going to restrict our discussion to the government of Uganda. Just look at it in that sense. A citizen is simply a legally recognized member of a state with, and with citizenship comes rights and privileges. I am a Ugandan, a citizen of Uganda, of Uganda and I, I enjoy certain rights and privileges by the virtue of that. There are citizens of other countries, talk about Kenya and the people that can have dual citizenship. They can be Kenyan and Ugandan at the same time, and the law provides for that. So we are going to look at these two, the government as defined and the citizen and what is their relationship in Uganda. But we are going to look at this in the sense of an ordinary citizen. So that begs the question, who is an ordinary citizen? And our work was made simple by a, a court of appeal decision in the case of Marema Bilizi versus Attorney General. That for those for the politicians like uh, Gubi, they will understand that as the Kojikwata court case that was decided in Bari. In that case, the court simply said an ordinary citizen, an ordinary Ugandan, is a person that has a national identity card, has a mobile phone, basic mobile phone. You don't need to have a smartphone. You can have just your cartouch. Uh, he listens to radio regularly, attends LC1 meetings, has a job. Uh, let's say he has a shop, let's say he makes Rolexes, let's say he has a garden that he, he tends to. He uses border borders and taxis, normal things, and takes his children to school. Maybe if where I come from, he takes his kid to Maracha Primary School. That is an ordinary Ugandan. That is the Ugandan you're looking at today, the most basic definition. We don't need to complicate it. We just look at it from that angle. So what is the relationship between that Ugandan that my panelists interact with on a daily and the, the government of Uganda. So the second part of our discussion looks at service delivery. Under the national objectives and directive principles of state policy of the 1995 constitution of Uganda, which is the constitution that runs this country, the government of Uganda is duty bound to deliver a number of services to its citizens, to the citizens, and in no particular order, 
These include peace and stability, education services, including free and compulsory basic education, medical services, clean water, food security and nutrition, among, other, among others. The delivery of these services, however, the delivery of these services, um, however, is a topic of debate. Has the government delivered them? How much can the government deliver? How far can the government go? Are the citizens the ones not being appreciative of government's effort? That is the discussion we are going to have today in the second topic, in the second part. So since we have my we have the panel assembled, without further ado, I'm going to repeat that once you're called upon to speak, kindly unmute, turn on your video since we have since this discussion is going to be uh, aired live on our YouTube channel, and then we can have a very meaningful discussion. So I'm going to shoot the first question to Mr. Gubi, uh, Kenneth. Uh, Kenneth, I understand that you are a politician. So as a politician, you interact with the ordinary Ugandans in Iganga almost on a daily basis. So I assure you. What in your view is the understanding of government by the ordinary citizens of Uganda? So Kenneth, that is your question, please. Do you now get me? Hope you get me now. I was saying that I'm very grateful to be part of this as a panelist. Bana moderator for today. Uh, like you have mentioned, my name is uh, Kenneth Gubi. Uh, I also have the other one of Chibumba. And uh, I come from Iganga district, which is uh, within Gusoga sub region, an ordinary citizen and the government. Yes, I am a politician. I've been in politics and I've been in government. I keep interacting with these citizens on a daily basis. And surely I want to share with you, our viewers, the understanding of any ordinary citizen, uh, 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 the understanding of the word uh, government by the ordinary citizen. Now, <clears throat> I want to kick off with this point that uh, an ordinary citizen, in his own view or in his understanding, tries to look at the government as a solution provider. The ordinary citizen says that when it comes to infrastructure development, government has a, an upper hand in developing this. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, in my constituency, that is Chibulu North of Viganga district, there are those rural roads which are really doing so badly. And so every time this thing passes there and maybe it gets stuck, or oh, these trucks that keep failing, uh, sugar cane, because you know, stuck. they really at government as, as a source. Government should be in position to actually solve them for him or for her is there and looking at government as a solution. Then also, so when it comes to things like a generally passed government to provide these free services, free healthy services, like if they are to go for medication in these hospitals or in these health cares, the ordinary person is expecting that such that when they are to go there for for maybe to, or check up these equipped uh, to solve their issues. So an ordinary citizen looks at government as the alpha and omega. Actually, some of them you, you also sympathize with them because they don't have any other only government bail or can put uh, uh, can promote their uh, conditions so they look at the government as the hope government should provide government should give them what they need now uh, also 
when you look at the education system, they still believe that the government is the answer. Government should come up and put up uh, education systems, uh, edu uh, improve the, 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 the education system, such that uh, their children also can attain uh, a good education. Now, like for example, government came up with the UPA and uh, use, but now most of these rural schools, you know, I'm talking about rural because my constituency is the other side. It is a rural side. So they believe that the government has not done enough to, uh, to, to like put good teachers that can be able to educate their children. Uh, yes, they also appreciate the fact that, yeah, okay, schools are there. Schools are there, at least like maybe uh, in a parish, there, 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 there can be a school or in a sub-county, there is a school, a government-aided school. But what is lacking in some of these schools, I think uh, they, they, they feel, yes, government has given us this, but also uh, government should go ahead and improve. Uh, we, need, we need these teachers motivated such that they can give the best to our children because uh, they, they feel what's happening in other places should also happen if children are passing in other places. So even in Chiguru North, where, I'm, uh, where, where, where I come from, uh, they feel also kids there should pass. So they entirely depend on government to provide these things. And uh, for such a reason, you really cannot condemn them because uh, the cost of putting up a school is quite high. And now, like, if you had to set up a, a, a private school that is to provide to provide such uh, 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 solutions, it can be quite expensive. And uh, now, if you are to charge expensively, of course, now they will still come and say, no, we can't. We are just ordinary people. We can't afford this, you know? Uh, then provision of safe water, still uh, government. Uh, uh, Gumi, the... Mr. Yes, Gumi, sir. Yes. Yes, we, sir. we are going to come to that other side of it. Eh? Okay. The, the service provision, we are going to come to it. So uh, thank you very much. We, we just wanted you to give us the picture. And I think you've okay. elaborately done that. And uh, we are very appreciative. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So let's move to the next panelist. I'm going to request that you turn off your video. And that panelist is going to be Annette. Uh, Nadunga. Annet Nadunga comes from um, the mighty Chambogo University where she is a lecturer. So I'm going to put this question to you, uh, Madam Nadunga. In your view, what should the ideal citizen government relationship look like in the context of Uganda? Thank you very much, uh, moderator and uh, viewers outside there. I'm really delighted to uh, be part of this program and discussion today about uh, the citizen government relationship in relation to service delivery. Uh, well, the question put forward about my view on how an ideal gov uh, citizen government relationship should be uh, is quite ambiguous and um, I'm thinking is there anything wrong with the current government uh, citizen relation uh, relationship? Secondly, how has it been like such that maybe we want to identify gaps? Because when we talk of ideal, okay, what should be the ideal? It's like, what should be, oh, the, the desirable or the perfect, how should it be like? How should that relationship be? So I'm looking at like um, there's something missing or a gap that needs to be uh, part here. I don't know that, but uh, of course we shall uh, find out in, in the discussion as we go on. So uh, here, how are we are seeing the relationship now? How is it like? How is the citizen relating with the government? Well. What is uh, going to inform our ideality or idealness in this case? What informs 
the, uh, the, the, the situation or the relationship to be ideal or not to be ideal. In this case, uh, we are going to use, of course, the constitution as the yardstick to guide our, uh, uh, our presentation or to guide my view on what is ideal or what is not ideal here. So of course, uh, we have already looked at who our citizen is, and we are in this case looking at, at an ordinary uh, citizen in this case. Who is an ordinary citizen? A citizen who is out there, as the, the, the moderator already uh, talked about, an ordinary citizen. We have understood the definition of this uh, ordinary citizen. So uh, we look at the relationship between the ordinary citizen and the, the government. How should it be? How does it ought to be according to the constitution? What does the constitution say about the relationship between the two? Of course, when we look at the constitution, it is really true that uh, citizens are at the center of the constitution. It caters for a lay citizen, an ordinary citizen. Uh, when we go to Article 1 of the Ugandan Constitution, it is very, very clear that all power belongs to the people. That is really equipping, of course, and upholding an ordinary citizen back there. So if all the power belongs to the, to the people, do we know this power as citizens? How are we using uh, the power? Of course, we cannot also forget that the government also is using the very constitution to govern us. So we consent that we should be governed by the constitution, of course, which derives power from the citizens and the government too uses the very tool to execute its duties. So it is our obligation as citizens to follow what is in the constitution. Then how do we follow what is in the constitution? We are called upon to know our duties and responsibilities as citizens. We, uh, we are supposed to fulfill our duties as citizens of, of Uganda. Of course, uh, I will not go through uh, the, the, the duties uh, of, of, of an ordinary citizen. We all know them, of course. We have to, one, respecting your, uh, your, your nation, respecting your nation, playing your duties uh, in, 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 in seeing uh, that the government is running uh, well, you pay your taxes well, your are also participating in, in a political affairs, are seeing that the other people are comfortable also in society. So those are the duties we are looking at here. So you as a citizen, are you, follow, are you following that? Are you fulfilling that before? So, and also on the other side, we are looking at the government. Is the government also playing its role? Is it also offering the, 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 the what we expect from it as rights, of course. We look at the government as an entity which is supposed to protect and uh, give us our rights as citizens, as we also do, uh, so we do our duties as, uh, as citizens. So that two have to work together for us to really realize an ideal uh, citizen government uh, relationship. Both of us have to play our uh, our, our duties so that we can realize that. So how can a citizen play their duties? One, they have to be informed. They have to be knowledgeable about these duties. Of course, you cannot do what you don't know. So I'm looking at an ordinary citizen in relation to the constitution. Do they interface with the constitution? Do they know their rights? Do they know their duties? That is a question at hand now. Well, if uh, we know our duties as citizens, then we shall do according uh, to that. But an ordinary citizen out there, I think when we talk about a constitution, it really appears as an abstract kind of 
an abstract kind of document, which some of us have even never may be opened and have never seen. So we hear from just here says, and we are not so certain of our rights as citizens. We are not certain of the duties we are to offer to our government. So we need to be informed as an ordinary citizen. You need to be informed at whichever levels. And how are they going to be informed? Of course, uh, through civic education, and uh, we thank uh, the, the, the CCG group, which has come up, of course, to go on ground to equip the ordinary citizen so, uh, such that they can know their uh, rights. For us to know our rights, for us to know our duties is really key in the running and uh, the day to day running of the government. We shall not be cheated, and then we shall not also cheat the government. As citizens, we need to be informed, we need to be uh, organized, and we need to be active so that we can hold our leaders accountable. We can also actively participate in the development uh, of uh, our, our, our state or our nation. So uh, basically, that is what uh, I'm looking at. An ideal uh, kind of an ideal kind of citizen relationship should be uh, decided as knowing their part and also the government knowing their part and also fulfilling duties on both sides. Thank you so much, moderator. Thank you very much, Annette. Um, that was very elaborate. Uh, you brought in the point and um, we appreciate you for that. So I'm going to request that you turn off your camera uh, so it doesn't interrupt our... Uh, thank you very much. So I'm going to move now to Sarah. Sarah um, was one of the first panelists at the time I logged in, and uh, we appreciate that you kept time. Uh, Sarah, we are currently facing the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, with that has come the, the, the induced, the, 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 I mean, the lockdown. We've seen schools closed. We've seen um, government trying its best to fight, but then there are talks of corruption. There are talks of everything. It, it's, it's like it's a boiling pot of problems. There's a mixture of everything. It's Katogo, if, 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 if you ask Uganda. So in your own, in your own view, uh, do you think COVID-19, the pandemic yeah. is Sarah? Hello? Yes. OK, there's echoes in your background. Hello. So Sarah, yes, Sarah, do you think the COVID-19 pandemic yeah. is going to make the citizen citizen government citizen relationship better or it will just worsen things that we are already not good okay thank you so much our moderator for the chance that you have given to me and thank you for making me one of the panelists in this discussion uh, the issue that you have given me to discuss is to see how the relationship, whether the relationship of the government and the citizen will improve during this COVID-19 or it will deteriorate. So looking at this, uh, COVID-19 came as a disease which was scaring people so much and everyone got scared. But during the beginning in March last year, 2020, uh, the government came in and the way the government was handling it, I looked at it was, it was uh, uh, something that the community appreciated. And uh, when I'm discussing this uh, point, this issue, I'm going to look at uh, both sides. At a certain point, I believe the government has done things in a better way in which the community has also appreciated. First of all, it has played its role uh, as the, a, a role of the government. One of the roles of the government is to protect its citizens. And when this COVID-19 came in, uh, to my view, I feel the government tried its level best to put in measures to see that the community doesn't get so much affected, uh, to put in measures of lockdown, it tried to improve on the health facilities. But also when you look at the community during that time, people were so much concerned 
and in the relationship by that time was so positive in a way that even the community came in to support government through providing the vehicles, it gave in some food, even down here in the community, some people sacrificed the food and they, they could even take some necessities to the, to the hospitals to help people who were admitted in the hospital. Uh, we are talking about when it started. Seriously, I believe that uh, during that time, the government was really supportive and uh, uh, people felt they wanted to work with the government. But it came in a point when the lockdown continued uh, persisting and they kept on increasing the dates, the days for lockdown. There, the community started having some negativity. It is just because the government somehow, somewhere failed to provide the support that the community needed. Remember, most of the people were locked down in places which maybe they are not their origin. origin. Somewhere in Kampala and yet they were supposed to belong to maybe Teso or any other place. But they found it hard. They could not provide themselves with the food. Some of them could not access medical services because of the transportation system. So there, I looked at it like this, the, the citizens down here in the community he try, get, got some negativity. The relationship started breaking a bit. But when you look at the, the actual sense of this COVID-19, because the major thing that we need to look at is the life. Life is better than any other thing that we may think of. Because as a community, there are many issues that have come in, which the, 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 the pandemic has affected. First of all, when you look at the education of the, the, the learners, it has so much got affected. And the, the community somehow has complained. Even when you look at the business sector, things are not moving on well the social life, the jobs, the health sector, and even the, the health of people, like people who got affected to recover from that COVID-19 was not an easy issue. So such issues to me, I feel are the ones which have caused the, somehow the negativity of the community. It has a bit created some negative relationship between the government and the community. But otherwise, I feel the government has tried it is level best, though the gaps are there. It has tried to immunize people, but people have not yet got immunized all. And even the dissemination of information, in fact, at first, the information went down to the grassroots even the youngest child could talk about COVID-19. I could know what is supposed to be done. And I think the community appreciated so much what the government did. But as we go on, you know, other issues come in, other factors come in. You find the attitude changes. To some extent, there's somewhere where the community may not agree on what the government is doing, they feel. There are some gaps which need to be filled. Like for example, the government at first, when we're trying to come up with a, a strategy of going back to school, the government was saying, we need to get some TVs. We need to, to secure radios for the learners per home, but all that failed. And that one, such things can make the relationship between the government and the community to be negative. But otherwise, to me, I feel that is what I had prepared for this. And on top of that, we need also to look at the roles as, as, as the citizens of Uganda. 
we need to understand that there's a role that we need to play in this COVID-19 era. We need to be responsible. The government has to take some part to do something, but also as an individual, we need to have our roles. As we all believe that the rights, rights are there, but also the responsibilities are there. So you cannot expect to be given your right when you have not fulfilled your responsibility. So we also need to continue talking to the community so that they come to understand their responsibility to come to cut down the, 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 the situation of COVID-19. For example, when we started, when the lockdown started, the, 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 the SOPs were observed at the beginning, but when we reached somewhere, people relaxed. And that was our responsibility as citizens. The government has not to come in all the time. So as a person also, as an individual, we need to observe SOPs and we need to, to know what we are supposed to do as citizens. We should know our responsibilities. And then also on the side of information, some of the institutions, some of the schools kept on keeping children who are but that is our responsibility as citizens of Uganda, which I know we need to play so that we also help the government to fulfill its responsibility. Thank you. That is where I can end on my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, that was a long and rich discussion on this topic. Um, I'm going to request a turn off your camera. Then I'll, I'll put... Uh, uh, the final question in this round, uh, I'll go back to Kenneth. And Kenneth, being a politician, I'm going to ask him this. Kenneth, how can community leaders like yourself and the other members on the panel today uh, help the ordinary citizens improve their relationship with government? So if the citizens don't understand what it is, how can you help them understand? If the citizens are expecting way too much, how can you help them um, uh, curtail their expectations and make it reasonable. And if the government is failing on its part, how can you ensure that the citizens work to ensure that the government uh, delivers on its own side of the bargain? So, Kenneth, we are back with you. Okay. I, I, I wanted to say that I'm, again, very grateful for the opportunity that you, you have given to me. And I hope I can say that he, how Okay, just that my video is not uh, really coming up. I don't know why. And we've said it's okay. You can proceed without the video. We, if it's not coming, you can proceed without it. Okay, fine. I, I, you posed the question and said that uh, uh, how can the government, or how can the, yeah, mm -hmm. how can government amend the relationship between them with the citizen? Or can how that, no. Yes. Hello. The question is. How can community leaders like yourself and the other members of the panel come again? How can community members, yes. community leaders, yes, yes. leaders That's like for, uh, yourself, community leaders, yes, like yourself, yes. help the government and the citizen improve their relationship? Okay, okay, thank you. Now, uh, the community leaders and the federal panelists today, uh, we can swing into action to help. Uh, a community to, 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 to improve on the relationship with the government through, number one, we need uh, sensitization. Uh, the, the leaders need to come up and uh, sensitize the population, uh, most especially about uh, what the government has done. And now like uh, I really give credit to CCG that is Center for Constitutional Governance. Uh, they have actually helped the government in, a, in one way of uh, educating. Now leaders like me, I was given chance. I sat uh, somewhere under the leadership of uh, CCG and I was taught some important information which up to now is helping me. And it has actually shaped me as a leader. So uh, government, and the leaders should actually uh, team up to ensure that uh, 
uh, the community gets to understand what is government doing, what is government planning, what has government done. You know, yes, government has done some things, but you know, uh, the, 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 the problem is that some of these things have gone unnoticed. They have gone unnoticed. Some or some people in the government, uh, they have not actually echoed some of these, some of these, these things that have been done by government to communities. Uh, like, for example, uh, government has actually uh, uh, always carried out immunization, a national-wide campaign to immunize children. So if uh, the leaders sit and just keep quiet about this and say nothing about it. Even the community, some of the, the people won't know even about it. But if the leaders and government can team up, fellow panelists can also echo the message to the people. People will get to know and say, okay, I think this is so good. Government has done ABCD. Ah, yes, we appreciate this. So there is a need for sensitization uh, of these activities that government has done. And also, in the same way, also uh, 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 the, community, the community leaders should actually try to find out what issues are affecting the community. Sit down with the, the, commu the, the, the community, with the people in the community, try to interact with them, find out what is really happening, what is not happening, what do you want to happen, what has happened. You see, that is a forum where you'll be able to find out that, okay, ABCD has already been done. ABCD has been promised. But also there is this other issue that is to be done. What do we do? How do we get to have it done? And then also uh, 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 get to know uh, what is in pipeline as far as government is concerned vis-a-vis -vis the community. So uh, there is need for interlinking of all these stakeholders to ensure that, he, uh, that there can be a smooth running and a smooth, and that humble, maybe that what? People should, be, should live happily. I don't know, Mr. Moderator, whether you are really getting me because I'm worried. Hello? Yeah, we are getting you. We are getting you, please. Just. Just Hello? that we are letting you speak uninterrupted so that we only come in okay. Okay. Uh, when we need to. But okay. for this particular discussion, we chose that approach, that we let you speak uninterrupted and we only come in when okay. there is need, there is extremely need to come in. Okay. Yeah, that's yes. true. Just that in my video has not also... Okay. My no, it's okay. So if, if, so that, that, that's if that's you're done... Why I was worried. So I was saying that he... It, so if that is your submission, then we can move to the next panelist. Yeah. Okay, fine. It's okay. Thank you very much, Gubi. We shall get back to okay. you. Okay, um, thank you. And thank you for that, 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 that submission. Okay. So I am going to move to... Okay, thank you. I am going to move next to Annette. Um, so we are going to now move more on the part of service delivery, and that is the second uh, arm of our discussion. And to Annette, I am going to ask uh, a specific question. Uh, so, Annette, how much has the government delivered on services for its citizens in your community? Um, if you look at specifically the sector of health, that is one, then you look at security and clean water. So don't bring in education, don't bring it. Let's just look at those because there are so many things and we we'll spend the whole day discussing them. But let's restrict our discussion to three. Clean water, security, and the provision uh, of health services. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, moderator, for another chance to speak uh, to the viewers. How has the government uh, contributed to the health, security, and uh, clean water? Uh, when we look at uh, the health sector in my uh, in my community, of course, I will not really say it has been. Um, so bad, government has tried uh, what it has done. It has uh, really uh, tried to see that there 
is proper health made, uh, healthcare in these health centers. There is uh, medica uh, sorry, proper supply of, of, of drugs and the, of course the human resource. But of course also given other factors which cannot of course allow government to intervene fully, uh, it has somehow affected the health uh, sector uh, greatly. For example, the numbers, when we look at the numbers, the numbers are shooting so high in, uh, in, in, in my community. People are so many. And now with this little uh, health sector, with this little hospital there, it cannot accommodate everyone. You go to a hospital and you, you, you need a service, you are a line of, of people there waiting to be at Tended to, and maybe what is being supplied is not really so adequate to facilitate the the, the, the community to cater for, for for all the people in the in the society. So it becomes really a problem. Well, government has tried what it can, but also given the the, the, the increasing population, we see that somewhere somehow there's something which is lacking. You can go and attend it too. One, the staffs are few. You go, there is only one doctor and he's overwhelmed by, by, by numbers. So at the end of the day, you might end up being bounced back home, you know? You come back maybe the next day because the, 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 the doctor has, is so tired. Sometimes also uh, the, 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 the medical workers, uh, this I will, I will somehow blame them, not blaming, but really caution them. They kind of don't really, give much uh, attention to, 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 to the patients. When it is lunchtime, it is lunchtime. Whether you're really bad loaf, it is lunchtime for them. If the out for a break, the out for a break. So really, uh, they, they really need uh, to be talked to and they, they change that kind of, of attitude. And then also, when we look at an ordinary citizen, of course, uh, we're talking about an ordinary citizen who is going to a health uh, facility to get medication. This person probably does not have the money, but surprisingly you reach a, a health center and they, they're telling you, well, uh, we don't have uh, this drugs ABC, but we can give you painkillers or we can give you first aid and then go to, to such and such a place or a pharmacy and get the, 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 the drugs which are recommended. And surprisingly, the drugs which they recommend you to go and buy the, the expensive ones. In hospital, they give you like a panadol and yeah, go and buy the others. So it really oppresses the, the, the ordinary person so much. It's like they, they, there is some gap. Is something missing? Is the government missing out on something? Is it really not supplying enough? Is it not supplying some certain kind of of drugs that we cannot really tell, but there is a, a really a very big gap in the health sector, which really needs to be addressed. The government has really tried, but also on ground, it really needs to be looked at. And this can only be addressed also if the community members get engaged, the citizens, the lay citizens, because uh, these uh, facilities, they come for our good to serve us as citizens. So we are stakeholders too. We need to intervene and also see how these uh, facilities are running. How is a health center running? How are they balancing? Has the government delivered this and this? How are they being supplied? So we can get some members in the community who are really knowledgeable to represent us or to also air out our views as ordinary citizens. Because of course we cannot all storm the, the health center and say, you know, doctor, this and this. Uh, we need uh, really that to be uh, worked on. There's this kind of inclusive participation if we need the health sector to, uh, to improve. And then also you talked about the, the security, the, the, the security status in, in my community. Well, uh, talking about security in my community, security has really uh, greatly improved, I can say. People have uh, their peace, people are living well in, 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 in my community. There's yeah, security. Apart from, of course, uh, 
multiple insecurities which are caused within the society. And of course, if this can be curbed, but uh, then the, the state or the government has really uh, tried so much on the side of security. For that, really, I cannot say uh, much about uh, security. We come to clean water. Well, wow. clean water. That one, there is a very big gap, I would say. And the government really needs to improve on, uh, on, on this. We know how water is very uh, essential in, in our well being in society. And let's, uh, let me first talk about maybe a place like Chambogo, where I'm, I'm working. This is a place with a very high population, very many students, staffs are there, and water is very essential. We look at the uh, areas of, in, uh, of convenience, we require water there. We require drinking water in the compound and so on. But when you walk in the compound, really, you see that there is a very, very big gap. There is need for government really to come in, uh, in, in in regard to provision of water and talk of clean water even. You can hardly move and find a tap where you can say maybe let me wash my hands or let me take water or something like that. Sometimes the rhinos are not, there's no water to, to make them clean. So we really need uh, this also to, to, to truly be addressed. The, the, the issue of clean water in our society. But again, it also again comes back to the, uh, to the community. It should be really a joint kind of, of venture between the government and, and the citizens. Well, the government can do what it can, but how about we, the citizens? Are we taking care of what is being put in place, the little which is being put, uh, put in place? How are we using it? The few taps are we taking care of them? The tanks which are implemented, are we taking care of them well? So it also comes back to us as citizens to also take care of the little which has been uh, given to us by uh, the government. Uh, well, uh, that's what I can say about that. Thank you so much, Goodwin. Back to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that was a great submission. Without further ado, I'll move to the teacher on the panel, that is Sarah. Uh, Sarah, as a teacher, I am sure you've heard the claims that the government has failed to deliver uh, as far as the education sector is concerned. We've read about the high failure rates. We've read about teacher absenteeism. We saw a video recently of a, of a, of a group of students, I think in Zombo, beating up a teacher who had gone to drink instead of teaching. You've seen the Oweso report saying that um, there's a huge gap, especially in primary education. I think they say that some children sit P7, when the qualification they have is only that of a P2, P2 uh, a people in P2. Um, some, some government officials themselves have admitted that there is actually a huge problem as far as education is concerned. So now as a teacher, someone that interacts with this on a daily basis, just given the importance of this sector, the one training the next doctor, the one training the next, health, uh, the next security person and every other... I mean, it feeds into all the other sectors that give us the services. I'm going to ask you, in your view, how should the government improve um, the education sector, especially primary education? And I'm going to give you uninterrupted seven minutes to make your point. Okay, thank you so much for this uh, opportunity that you have given to me once again. Uh, the, you want to find out how best education can be provided, mostly in primary schools. So first of all, to begin, I would like to appreciate the government so much. We can't say that the government has failed completely to provide education, but still, as the reports have been given, the observations have been made, we have seen that there are still more gaps that need to be filled. Uh, since the introduction of UPE, that is Universal Primary Education in 1997, 
which was promised by the president during his campaigns in 1996. We have been struggling. In fact, we have come from far. I would like to appreciate the government because when you look back from that time when the primary free education was introduced, to me, I feel there is some change. We can't take ourselves that we are still on the other way that we, when we started UPE. So looking at the improvement that is supposed to be needed, I know there are gaps mostly, mostly in primary government schools, mm -hmm. and that is our concern today. Because when you look at the education sector, we have two categories. We have the primary private schools and we have the primary government schools. But the most hit sector or section is the government sector. Uh, me as being one of the CCTs, um, CCT is the center coordinating tutor. So I always move around checking on the performance, checking on how teachers do their work. I really see that there's a gap that needs to be improved. And I accept that the government should come in. And one of the things that I feel should be done most especially is the involvement of all stakeholders in the provision of education from the bottom to top or from top to bottom. Meaning that the whole, the whole stakeholder system has to be involved. We have the ministry, we have the district, we have the school level, we have the community level, we have a parent, we have the child himself. So all those stakeholders need to have a hand to see that the education is improved in the country. So for the issue of the government, there is a lot that needs to be done because it is the one to the education system. And you know everything, when you do it without enough funds, at times mostly it, it, it ends up failing or not coming up the way you expect. So that is why we are seeing that the, the objectives, the original objectives of the education annuity fully achieved. So there's that involvement which is needed. Even the politicians have to come in. Then number two, and most of my discussion is going to base, and when you look at it, it is going to base on, on the government support mostly. Because when you talk of the infrastructure and facilities that are found in schools, you'll find that in most of the primary government schools, the infrastructure, the, the classrooms are not up to date. Though some have been improved, I know the government has done something, but there's still a gap. Some schools, the, the structures are really looking bad, of which even when the teacher is in class, like when rain comes, he, the teacher gets worried, mostly deep there in the rural schools. He, we are looking at infrastructure in the form of classrooms. We are looking at the teacher's quarters, we are looking at the desks. See, some students, some learners are just sharing desks. And at times they, are, they, they keep on pushing themselves. So you find that the learners are not settled in class. They, 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 the environment is not so much conducive that can allow a child to really settle and learn. There is a lot of worry in class. Then also when you look at the facilities like electricity, some of our schools have come, come up with sections of boarding like for, for upper classes, but at times the, the, the electricity is not provided. The lighting system is not good. So at times when they want to do their preps, things become hard for them. In some of the schools that have gone, I've seen also there's a problem of water. You find learners going long distances to collect water at times like when they're cooking food, they have to make sure that they, they, they provide water for their food. So such facilities affect the learners. And if the government cannot come in, at least put right those things, I know that the education system will still lag behind. Because when a child is comfortable in class, even the learning takes place. In number three, 
I feel the government should invest in supervision and inspection of schools. Uh, more funds should be put on the on the supervision of teachers and the leaders, the, the head teachers. As you say that first that the reports have come that teachers don't teach. Uh, as a result of that, even it is because these teachers are not supervised. They go to class at times they do what they feel they want to do. So it, it, when the, the government puts in much on supervision, it, there's a chance that it, what the teachers do is always observed. And at least we always even help them. Because the major reason why we go to supervise, we go to support them to know what they are supposed to do. But if they are left at that free range, at times you find a teacher doing his or her own things. Even the district has to come in to keep on checking how the leadership is going on in the school. So that is provision and inspectorate part, I feel should be done seriously. Looking at the policies that have come in in education, the government can come up with a policy, like for example, the thematic curriculum was brought in, but because of lack of supervision and inspection, some schools up to today have not taken up that curriculum to be on ground, and mostly the private schools. Then another gap on the supervision issue. There is a tendency of the government to look at mostly the government schools and leaving the private schools. And yet all these schools bring up our citizens of Uganda. Tomorrow they come to serve the nation. So you find that what may be taught in a government school may be somehow different from what is taught in a private school. And you know, most of the time people look at the exam issues, people teach according to way, the way the exams are set. So when you look at the curriculum, the way it is set, there are some subjects which are in, which are not examinable. So when it is a, a private school for them, they don't mind of that. That's why we, can, we end up coming with the citizens who cannot even create their own jobs because they're after passing exams with the high pass rates. But in the actual sense, they may not be able to do what, a, a, as you say, the, the P7 looks like a P1. So those are the issues. The government should put in much effort on supervision. Then there is also this issue of creating incentives. These teachers need to be motivated to do their work. We can create incentives, the rewards for the best performers, in education service delivery uh, by improving their welfare. Uh, how can we improve on their welfare? One, we can, the government, I think, can improve on the re remuneration, that is the payment of the teachers. Uh, to me, I feel that money is not so bad, but government should see how he can improve on. And if that money was like that and there are other privileges, there are some allowances, there's the medical, this medical services given to the teacher, I feel it would be better. But that salary is consolidated. Everything is there, accommodation is there, feeding is there, medication is there. So I feel that money is little for the teacher. Then also on the side of their welfare, we can look at the living conditions and working conditions. This is a primary teacher who may go to school. At times, some schools may not, if you find a leader who is not well organized, you may find the, the teacher stays at school without a meal in this government school. So if, it is, if a teacher does not take an initiative to organize and see how they can have meals, it becomes a challenge because that vote, I think, is not there in the UPE. The UPE grant is given purposely for the learner. So the upkeep of the teacher in the school is solely on the, on the side of the teacher. Mm -hmm. Then when you look at the living condition, the class that the teacher is seated on, seated in, you may find that the, desk, the, the tables themselves are not there. 
the teacher has to be creative and look for some maybe a desk to sit on an officer which i feel really it demoralizes the teacher in his or her work and also the the accommodation they are given when you go deep down there in the villages you may find that some teachers are still sleeping in grass thatched houses so that gives a teacher a very low morale to do his or her work so i feel the government should come in so much to see that the life of a teacher is improved you know when your life is better you are also able to serve to serve, to, to to serve the nation and give the best services you can manage then when you look at also there are some teachers who are teaching hard to reach areas like karamoja uh, those allowances but somehow somewhere they delay in concern that these people should receive their allowances in time so that they can do their work perfectly and you realize that most of the teachers who serve in those areas are not from those areas so they have to put in transport they have to put in what they have lost at home they are not in their homes so i feel the government should always come in and make sure that it fulfills its promises it also we can introduce rewarding of best performers we may not look at only teachers but we can also look at students the learners themselves It's like if a child has performed very well in, in the final exams maybe at primary level p7 ploe at a district level we can see come up with some way of rewarding those learners that so that the other learners can also be motivated to work hard and perform well and not leaving the teacher there are also those teachers which can who can be identified who can get a team maybe at a district level move around supervise and see how we can identify those teachers and reward them i want to thank the government in the past two years that that was done and some teachers got some rewards so i feel if it was to continue it would be better it can also give teachers morale to do their work not forgetting also the head teachers there are some head teachers who really put in their effort and they really put in they even sacrifice to make sure that the school does better so another thing that i feel the government should do to improve on the primary primary education is the to improve the teacher training uh, we are training teachers like for example in a primary in pre ptcs the training takes two years but when you look at the syllabus itself what is supposed to be covered the theoretical part and the practical part it is too wide so at times some things go unnoticed and i feel the time given is not enough Uh, i would like to thank the initiative which is still on the way the teacher policy which is going to be introduced and it is designed in a way that teachers may take like four four years in the, in the, in the course these teachers to get all the skills that would help them to handle our learner down there and that learner graduates in p7 as a person who is supposed to 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 serve um, the, the 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 country sara yes uh, thank you very much sara mm you get welcome i'm getting you okay that that submission has been very elaborate yes okay i was saying thank you very much sara before we went off you're welcome that has been a very, very wonderful submission <laughs> I was also saying should I can because there is something which I remain but I don't know whether I can because stop there. In the, in the interest of time. Yes. We are going to go with what you've given in any case you you you've you said it all almost um okay, if there okay, is a government okay. technocrat that was listening in and copied your notes they, they they know a lot now um where there is okay. need for improvement. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to move to Amir Kisha Amir Kisha wasn't originally on the panel but uh, joining us Amir please first mute Okay 
So you're going to go to Amir, Amir Kisha next. Amir works with the uh, Ehsan, which is a charity organization, and she volunteers there. Ehsan, Ehsan, Ehsan. So I'm going to ask you this question, Amir. Um, as, as a person that works with a charity organization, a private entity uh, that is doing a lot of work out there, helping the communities and all that. So my, I want to understand how best can organizations such as charities, the non-government organizations work with the government and the citizens in ensuring better service delivery uh, in a country like Uganda. So Amir, the floor is yours. Okay, That's thank okay. you so much. I, I think I think that organizations like us can work with the government um, in a ways like uh, setting up angel investors that can um, assist citizens that have ideas that can change the lives of people. What do I mean by angel investors? Angel investors are kinds of, uh, for example, let me up with an idea in the community and uh, probably that idea is viable. That idea could be able to help thousands of people. For, for example, the expectant mothers, the children, the people in uh, low communities that uh, need this kind of help. You can approach one of those stores and give them your idea. If you have a valid idea, they'll be able to support you without expecting from you. And this idea could probably help to an example of a neighbor who has a, for example, if you have a big piece of land that you want to sell because you're poor and there's a family that lives nearby, that family will say, okay, let me buy this piece of land. When they buy that piece of land, probably the whole family and the neighbor as well will work on that piece of land and do small farming. In that case, everyone is benefiting. Everyone is benefiting. Also, I think things like uh, social entrepreneurship, for example, if the government can help uh, in creating organizations that can help the community and community projects, it would be, it would be very good. I, I think that... Uh, um, long, long time ago, it, and uh, anti nato officers. Now, we don't have those things anymore. And yet, there are still so many nurses and midwives out there who don't have jobs. There are so many midwives and nurses out there who don't have jobs. If we could bring that back, back in the days, they to go door to door rings to check out how uh, back it would be able to help a lot in reducing the maternity rate. It would be bringing up the small children, for example, because when you go to when when you go door to door for such kind of uh, help, you probably be able to get all the information of who needs that kind of help. Who doesn't need that problems that we have today with the ladies in maternity is because most of them don't follow up on their auntie and cap on them every other day. That would make it an alice that the government, yes, provides free education for all of us, but they fail to provide things. So that makes it diffusion is free. Yes, but when I go to school, they send you back home because you don't have the materials. So is the education really free when you don't have the stationery? No, because you're going to go home, sit at home. Your parents have no job especially in this pandemic, everyone has been sent back home. Now there's no school and, and there's nothing going on. Usually there are also parents and uh, elder sisters and brothers who are willing to help, but now all of them are sitting at home. No one has a job, no one can help you in any way or the other. 
So if you're sent back home because you don't have stationary or scholastic materials, is the education really free? Is the education really free? So um, in this regard, I'd also like to appreciate the fact that I've been able to be included in this call. And um, I think that private entities like uh, charities and private sector players can partner with our government if they actually get together as one. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Amir. Uh, that was on point and precise to the point as well. So um, let's, let's, let's turn to Annette. Uh, uh, Annette, in a similar, more or less the same line of argument. We, we, we have the churches, we have the mosque, uh, we have the cultural institutions. Traditionally, some of the best sorry, schools- Sorry, but sorry. Some of the best schools in this country are those uh, run by churches and mosques. Uh, in, in the past, just before independence and just after independence. Uh, lately, we don't see much of that happening. We don't see new school, church, uh, the churches building more, more of these new schools or getting so much involved in the, in the delivery of services, say health and education. How best in your view can um, community leaders like yourself, citizens, the government, and all these stakeholders work together to ensure that this other arm of this other arm of the society, the churches, the mosque, and the religious institutions step in and also play the uh, also help out in filling the, the gaps as far as provision of um, services is concerned. Well, uh, thank you very much, Goodwin. Once again, uh, you have clearly noted that uh, when we flash back on on, on the pre-independence time or the colonial time. Education was uh, education, uh, uh, health facilities, and the infrastructure, other infrastructures which are owned by by the church or religious organizations. Uh, when we talk about uh, formal education in Uganda, we trace it back to the advent of the Christian uh, European missionaries who really championed that section. So we really see a lot of schools came up. Uh, through the church, which were really doing so, so uh, well. Many hospitals came up through the church and the religious bodies, which uh, really did so well. But of course, uh, during the uh, post-colonial era now, which we are in, uh, that we don't have now these people who brought the idea on the ground, the power now remained to us the Ugandans or the citizens, and uh, much of the powers, of course, were now given to the government to take up the education sector, the health sector. Of course, those were really key uh, sectors which the government needs to really uh, take really much responsibility to see that they, 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 they run uh, well. Now, uh, their contribution, uh, the contribution of the church or religious bodies and the cultural institutions really kept on reducing Nowadays, the church really seems like uh, it is silent in service delivery. There's nothing much it is contributing. Well, it is also trying somewhere, somehow, but uh, not so engaged like during those days when, uh, when the church was really out there to see that um, people get uh, services, social services, like education and, the, and, the, and the health care. Well, what can uh, we do now? And what happened? Let me talk about what happened. When we look at uh, the government coming in to take up the education sector, let me say, the church also relaxed. One, of course they lacked funds, maybe to run the, 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 the schools or to manage them so well, and maybe the whole center. So they had to call upon government to intervene and help them through. But as government takes on, the church now sits and looks on. But we shall not, of course, all that blame the church. There are also reasons as to why they are not greatly involved in service by delivery. One, we look at a cost of putting up a school or putting up a, a health facility. It is not really cheap. If you want to really put uh, up a really standardized kind of facility, unlike these other ones, which are not really of standard, but if you want to put up a standard 
facilities you need really adequate funds to, to, to help you uh, achieve that. So when we look at our churches, our religious bodies and, and, and the cultural institutions, really, they don't have enough funds to help them do that. They don't have a stable kind of, of, of income or a source of income where they say they can get money from there and then put in to see that really the community is, is running well in terms of service uh, delivery. So inadequate funds is one of the challenges that church uh, or religious bodies face. That's why they're, they're, they're so reluctant in, in, in this. Uh, secondly, there is also a general mentality, I think, in us. Of course, we are the church. We are the religious body. There is a general mentality we have that, well, service delivery is for government. It is government's responsibility to see that we get uh, the, 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 the social services on ground. So that has made us uh, also relaxed. The church is relaxed looking at the government. Okay, the, the cultural institutions are relaxed looking at the government because back of their mind, they know that it is the government's uh, responsibility to do that, which is really not, uh, not true. Because if, uh, if we are to, to, to really attain uh, a proper supply of, of social services to, to the communities, we also need to be engaged, not just looking at the government alone. And church, of course, or religious institutions and cultural institutions being so key in society, need to really come in and also uh, support government in one way or, or the other. And then also maybe another factor which is limiting them to, to, to get involved is uh, the idea of uh, bureaucracy. Someone to begin a school, to begin a health facility, it is not something which will wake up from you know what I want to give back to my community. Maybe as a church, we have organized this. We want to run maybe a health center here maybe uh, uh, in, in alongside our church, you want to put a, a medical center. But you're putting this medical center, it's not just going to operate in isolation with the standard measures which the government puts. So you have to go through the necessary uh, procedures to, to get a working permit, to get human resource, to work on, 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 on really the, the, the best standards. So, this process looks so tedious and really scares away most of the people or most of the lead, uh, churches or religious bodies to come and get engaged in, in, in service delivery. So maybe if the church, or oh, sorry, the, the, the government should loosen up a bit in case they see, well, the church is willing to begin something, they should come in and back it up so that yeah, it can catch up so quickly to cater for the, uh, for the community. And then uh, on the side of the government, sometimes uh, the government, I think, has monopolized uh, much of these uh, sectors, the education sector, the health sector. We, 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 we see the government like it feels like another body cannot run it so well, apart from the government itself. So well, it is true because uh, a lot, a lot goes on if 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 these sectors are not censored. But the government needs also to relax and also give powers to these other people. For example, the religious bodies, the the the, the cultural institutions, to also take part in service delivery without really restricting them on 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 what to do and what not to do. They should yes come in, but their influence should not be like to question them, why are you doing this? And uh, you're doing it in a bad way, but rather to guide them on, uh, on how to provide proper service delivery to the, to the people. And also the government should also come in to give uh, financial support. Of course, the church alone or cultural institutions alone cannot stand uh, fully to give uh, this, this service delivery properly. They still also need the help of the government at the end of of the day. So the government needs also to help them financially, to appreciate their work, to also motivate them and also recognize their services in the, in the society. So government needs to come in to, to, to put also a, a voice to see that these bodies are encouraged in, in service delivery enhancement. Well, uh, I think that's what I can say on that. 
Thank you very much. Um, we are now coming to the end of our discussion. So I'm going to move back to uh, Mr. Gubi. Uh, Mr. Gubi has been very, very elaborate in his submission today, and we thank you for that. So Gubi, this is your question for now. How best can ordinary citizens of Uganda seek and demand better services from their government today? I mean, everyone seems to suggest that. There's a gap. Though even those are saying that there is something done, so that there is more that can still be done. So how best can the citizens of Uganda demand for that that is still missing? Gubi, that's your question. And I request that you turn off your video. Gubi, I don't know if you've tried to unmute. Looks like you're still on mute. Oh, yes. Uh, do you get me now? Loud and clear. Okay, thank you, Godwin. Now, uh, I did want to thank you once again, and uh, I also thank my fellow panelists who have actually given in their submissions. It's quite good, quite encouraging that we have people of such brains. Thank you so, so, so much, fellow panelists, plus uh, our Buana Godwin, the moderator. Uh, the question that has been posed to me once again is how best can the ordinary citizen of Uganda, me and you, demand for better service delivery from the government? And uh, this is what I really have to say. Uh, number one, uh, uh, through application of the bottom up approach, where issues are raised from the down person, that is to say the local person through LC1, two, three, four, five, uh, four where we have the, the mayors, the what, what, five, then members of parliament, up to the time it gets to cabinet, uh, such that a solution can immediately be got. So this is one of the ways through which uh, these the citizens of you, of the nation can be able to bear demand for better services because if they sat and resolved and said this is an issue that is affecting us and uh, they raise these issues to the relevant people like uh, people that have been uh, voted or people that have been put in these places uh, uh, of authority then it, 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 it calls for that uh, these issues should be handled. So it's one of the ways of how uh, a, a, a citizen or a local or an ordinary person can be able to, to demand for better services. And then number two, uh, through analyzing the performance of the elected leaders, another way of how a citizen can be able to demand uh, uh, better service delivery is through analyzing critically the performance of these people that have been elected, like a member of parliament, a uh, NATO chairman, NATO C3, uh, NATO C1 also, uh, should be accountable to the people. Because we cannot, it, it cannot be really prudent to have an LC1 chairman. And uh, in that place where we have an LC1 chairman, there is a lot of, uh, there are very many thieves disturbing the people. Uh, people cannot, the people's goods are being stolen. Like in my, my constituency in Iganga, if you have a place and a, a, a village and have an LC1, and in that place, thieves are running up and down every now and then. <clears throat> you know, that for uh, maybe a meeting that the people should sit, the village people, the village council, the stakeholders, the citizens, this is not good. Hmm? Actually, uh, uh, that's why you now it, you hear people saying in the government, 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 yambe, you know, because of such issues. So, but you know, people are able to sit, and some of these issues uh, can be ironed out. So, uh, that's a way of demanding for better service. 
by uh, and the other one is uh, meetings also should be meetings between leaders and locals should always be held you know if you have been uh, put into this uh, position Uh, maybe through a ballot, people voted for you. Uh, it shouldn't end on voting for you. You should go further. Take people on five zip and be happy for you. Five check the tips such that uh, these people in that better service that they voted for. Every time you are campaigning, every time you are standing for an elective position, uh, you know, you talk to the people, you tell them when you're he, when he interested with this, I'm going to ensure that ABCD is going to be worked on. So it's very, very, very good if those meetings can be conducted because uh, that's, I think that's where you can be able to iron out uh, some of the differences. Then also, uh, it would be so good that uh, if uh, records are kept, records are kept and always fold up to ensure that the leaders deliver, you know? Uh, like, for example, uh, during campaigns, His Excellency, the, pres the President, uh, General Number 7, on always pledges. There are many pledges that he, he has made to this country, the president, and uh, some of them he has fulfilled, and some of them he has not fulfilled. Why? Some of them have not been fulfilled because he perhaps forgot and the people near him, you, you pledged this to these people in this area. And you, uh, you know, uh, these are 10 years down the road. You have not delivered. We have not delivered what you, you pledged to the people. But if there was no record that was actually put down, how are they going to be able to remember? How is, how is the president going to be able to remember that? Oh, the people of Busoga, I pledged that uh, I'm going to, 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 to build, I'm going to put up uh, a, 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 a factory that processes sugar cane into some other, uh, into some maybe sugar, into sugar or into, you know? so we need such, we need such records to be generated such that other uh, people, such that the people can attain uh, better services. Uh, monitoring systems should be put in place to ensure that what was intended to be achieved is actually achieved. And then also this should be, uh, uh, this should be independent. Because if you are the person that has been put into this place, into this position, and then you are the same person that puts up this monitoring tool, it implies that you are going to corrupt it because you want your interests to be met. So you, you try to corrupt the, 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 the system, the monitoring system. So there should be monitoring tools, monitoring equipment, monitoring methods that should be put in place to ensure that uh, an ordinary citizen indeed uh, gains or profits uh, from uh, 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 government, uh, government what? Government services uh, that are being delivered to them. So uh, there is no way that he, there is no way uh, that he, you can be able as an elected uh, member or person. Uh, you can be able to achieve or you can be able to effectively deliver services to, to the local person or to the citizen without you uh, 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 also being monitored. There should be those checks and balances 
Huh? There should be, they should be check you. They should, you also should check yourself. Huh? Living alone, so yourself, you should be able to uh, monitor yourself. What did you pledge? Hmm? What are you, are you really listening to the people's voices? Are you representing their views? Are you really delivering to them the services that are, are, are required in those places? You know, there are some of us come from places. Yeah, I acknowledge the fact that there are those who come from town. But personally, I come from a rural place, and that is Iganga, uh, not Iganga town, but uh, Nabite and the sub county is my sub county. Now, local parishes, the roads are quite impassable. Hmm? The roads are impassable. Uh, uh, actually, uh, what is happening there is that, uh, okay, there are these in the sub county, every sub county, okay, there is a healthy, a healthy facility. But uh, you know, even when you like facilities, uh, you know, when you try like to wake up one day and you go there, the, the, the people who are coming for these services will tell you that you know, we have only one nurse and he tend to them, you know? You also sympathize with this nurse. How really is she going to be able to attend to all these people? And every person walks away satisfied that yes, I've been good, given good service, you know? So you really find that in these people that have been elected uh, or put into these places that matter, uh, there is too much they really have to do to ensure that uh, better service delivery is attained by uh, the local person. Uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, I don't know, but... Uh, uh, I think I can leave it at that. I really hope I've been very, very clear. Thank you so, so, so much. You have been very clear. So I'm going to turn to the other pan the, 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 the two panelists on the on the panel. I'm going to start with uh, Sarah, and then I'll finish with Annette, and that will close our discussion. So for the two, I'm going to just ask you, in a minute or two, Briefly, as brief as you can be, just tell us how are you spending this period of the lockdown? Um, what what have you learned? Anything new? And uh, is there a book you've read? Anything? Just tell us anything about this lockdown uh, and how you've spent your time. So I'm giving each of you two two minutes, then we shall close the discussion. Thank you so much, our moderator. Uh, for me, since I'm a teacher. So most of my time, I do some gardening. I go to the garden, uh, look after my gardens, do some farming. I have a cow at home that I have to care for. And then also during the first lockdown, I developed a skill, art and craft, and I made some baskets uh, for shopping. So. When I make some baskets, I keep selling them. And then also this lockdown, since I'm a student at Kiambogo, pursuing my master's, I embarked on my research. I'm working on it. It is one of the activities that has taken most of my time during this second lockdown. But amidst the research, I also do the gardening, I also do, I care for the, the domestic animals. So basically that is what I do. And the SAMU course on online, I attend them. We always even have class, Zoom classes with our students. But the problem is most of the students don't attend. I think they have a problem of poverty. They, don't, they cannot afford the data. So in a class, we have a total of around 130, but you find only 25 attend. So those are issues in our education system. So those are basically the things that I do during this COVID-19 lockdown. Thank you, moderator. Those are my submissions. Yes, so far that is what I have done. 
I I have a garden of matoke. So I keep organizing it, digging, pruning. Then there is also coffee. Now I've started picking coffee. So those are the activities that I do. I pick some coffee, sell it. At times I store and dry it and then I sell. So to earn a living, those are the things that are supporting me. Some poultry work is also there, but not much. That is what I've done so far during this COVID-19 lockdown. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to thank you very much, all the, the other panelists, for the discussion we've had. It's been a very informative and wonderful one. And uh, this brings to an end the second episode of our community engagement uh, under safe spaces. Um, and we hope that we'll have the next one next week and even be as good and informative as this one. Thank you very much. Uh, God bless you all. God bless Uganda. Have a great day and a great week. Music